morning, everyone. This morning is Sunday, May 28th, 2017, and we all we welcome you to our roundtable brought to you from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, recorded at Plainfield, New Jersey, United States of America. We'll start this morning with our prayer. Uh, this one is from Watches, Prayers, and Arguments, page 73. Mrs. Eddy. Father, teach me how to still the clamoring of sense and fill my place as listener that I may hear thy voice and grow to understand thy word and so become thy messenger. Then teach me how to banish pride and stubborn will that I may be thy representative with no false sense of human zeal that every word may bless and heal when I thy message give. And miscellaneous writings, page 279. We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind, for then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind, as when the earth was without form, and mind spake, and form appeared. Mary Baker Eddy. Our subject today, Ancient and Modern Necromancy, alias Mesmerism and Hypnotism Denounced, Golden Text, Matthew 6, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ Jesus. So um, before we get into science and health, we will talk a little briefly on the Bible. We had a good Bible session yesterday on the three temptations. So if you want to know more about that, you can listen to the recording. Uh, anyone want to comment on the responsive reading or golden text or any part of the Bible? Well, I liked how it emphasized the importance of watching and being sober. Being sober, of course, is a mental state, not a physical state. Not just being without alcohol, being without any wrong mortal influence. Yeah, the responsive reading, and I, I wrote on, a, on the forum, this idea of, of falling away comes first. And, and it talks about, it talks about peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. These things, they seem to come out of the blue, but they, they don't. And so what is the falling away that takes place? Thinking that everything is good, that maybe you've gotten into a good relationship or a good position at work or something like that, and everything's going right, so you don't really need God anymore, or you don't pay attention or, you know, keep your communication with him. Thank you very much. That's exactly right. Yep. And and everything is all right with you. You, maybe everything is all right with you. So it doesn't matter that people are suffering all around the world. This is why we watch. I think that really if we are our neighbor, then if it shouldn't be we shouldn't take it for granted that if it's all right with us, then it's all right. You know, we shouldn't care. Um. That's so true. This is Eddie said, as long as there's one person suffering, we have worth it. And I did want to mention, 
too. We are, this is Memorial Weekend, and so we make sure we should be doing this daily. So we pray for all those that are in the service, keeping our nation and our world safe. Certainly express gratitude to our veterans. But also, we, we should be doing this daily, not just this weekend. But we, we better be sober and watchful this weekend. Because to many people, and I know myself too, I mean, this as a teenager, this was the weekend we all went to the Jersey Shore and got a suntan. I mean, how selfish is that? So, anyway. <laughs> Remember, let's be watchful and sober. And let there not be a falling away, because, of course, it first comes individually before it comes to an entire nation. I think the, the Galatians thing follows this, that you might think you're getting away with it, and it says God is not mocked. Not that God will punish you, but what you're doing, the neglect of you know, staying in touch with God you know, will bring its own results to you. So can't deceive, you can't think that you're deceiving anyone. You're not mocking God either. Thank you very much. And, and it also says, uh, when it says, let no man deceive you by any means, except there come a falling away first. In other words, you have to be open to being deceived. you already be falling away. That's it. Absolutely. The mesmerism is out there. Mesmerism is out there, and certain, certainly all the materiality that is saying, you know, go shopping for your mattress this weekend or whatever, um, emphasizing the material thing, as we've talked about often in that wonderful movie that uh, from Colorado sent to us, Amazing, Amazing Love, I think it was called, about us today. Okay. Okay. And what... Jeremy, what? Well, I just remember the, the Hosea telling them that, you know, things were not going to go well if they continued to, to not listen to God. And the shopkeeper said, our guys are doing just fine by us. And then they ended up in slavery. Yeah, I mean, the most, you know, the most dangerous situation to be in is not when you're sick or when you're facing a, a problem that seems, you know, insurmountable. The most dangerous position to be in is when everything seems to be going all right. Because that's when you're tempted to let down, not be grateful, and to not be looking out for others, and not to be watchful for what evil is trying to do. One of the things that was hardest for me to accept was the fact, Mrs. Eddie points it out, that evil is always at work. Now you don't, you know, you don't give it a lot of power or reality. But however, forces of mesmerism are always working, trying to undo truth, trying to take the place of truth. Always working. So you always have to be alert. That's why going to sleep or being self-satisfied is the most dangerous state to be in. And I remember growing up, you know, getting meeting people in the Christian Science churches who were terribly self-satisfied. They had made wonderful demonstrations. They had learned the truth. And it was the death knell of their church. Absolutely. Not now, not to you know put fear of God in there, everybody, but or the you know fear of the well, devil. Won't hurt. But yeah, it'll, it'll never hurt. <laughs> but we we can't ever stop being alert to the fact that evil is is, is trying to infiltrate. It's always working wherever it can. It makes inroads where people are sleeping, or in this 
state of everything's lovely and we must be loving and all is well. And we must be tolerant. Tolerant. Be careful what you're tolerant of. You're not to be tolerant of evil. And remember, the problem is that people personalize it and think, what's a dear, poor person? It's never person, place, or thing. Even the word tolerate just means putting up with something not good. <laughs> it absolutely does. So ask yourself, what are you tolerating in your life? What are you allowing that you know is not principled? And then begin to pray and work and to do something about it. Because error will enlarge its claims. But this is being awake and sober and watchful. Actually, one of the huge issues in society is a virtue to be able to tolerate things. Yes. Yeah. It's considered a virtue. Yes, it is. But it's not. You're accepting something that shouldn't be. And that's the ploy of the devil, is to twist your thought, make you think something that is wrong could be the highest human right, when in fact, it is not. And many get hooked up on that. That's why Mrs. Eddy's teachings are so tremendous, because she makes that distinction between human goodness and divine. I mean, I, I had never heard of it before in my years in science till I came here and began to read the Carpenter books. I didn't know that distinction. And, and nor, as Gary said, I thought, well, having, you know, everything materially, uh, that was your goal, you know, healthy, have a nice home, everything just perfect. <laughs> and that, that's not your goal. It's not your goal at all. Goal is spiritualization of thought, the spiritualization of mankind, and the destruction of sin. That's a whole different ball game. And yet, people are are tempted in the organization to, to rest on their laurels with that because they don't know better and they need to be awakened. I, I am going to, at the end of each of these roundtable sessions, I'm going to start reading the David Keeston article, which I found in a box of my papers. It was written in 1997. And it's called What Prospers Healing? And it is quite an article. And at some point, we will have it on our website as well. He has it on his website, too. Oh, he does? Okay. Put it, Google it. Quite an article. I, I mentioned it at our membership meeting for those people that were there. I quoted from it. But we are going to go through it because it is extremely important to know this. So, and to get back to what Florence was saying about the Galatians and sowing and reaping. Yes, and it has been my experience that you can sow something for a while, either good or bad, and you won't see the effects, which is partly why it can put you to sleep, because you can think you're sowing good until suddenly it blows up with some kind of destruction. Or you can be sowing bad and think you're getting away with a lot until it blows up with some kind of a destruction. So watch what you are sowing. What did you write on this Yeah, I mean, you're always planting seeds of thought in your consciousness. And so look, look at what, what you're allowing to be planted in your consciousness. What kind of seeds do you allow in there? Because whatever seeds you allow into your consciousness are going to sprout up. That's why you're careful what you say to yourself. You can ask yourself, do I want this to actually happen? You're just toying with some something. You know, even something like, well, I, I really, I don't like it here, I want to move. Well, if you think that long enough, chances are you will move. <laughs> but do you want the effect of your thought? Watch what you're thinking, always. What do you say to yourself? Make sure it's something of God, because it will it will sprout up. I'd like Linda. I want you to read your definition of strength. Okay. With um, 
the line from our lesson that said, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. So I looked up in Webster's 1828 dictionary and some of the words that were used were firmness, solidity and t or toughness, power or vigor of any kind, that which supplies strength, strength, security, spirit, with a capital S, that which supports confidence, soundness, vehemence, and fortification. Wow, thank you. That's quite a definition. And God is the strength of my life, the psalmist says. All of these things God's providing for you when you know it and when you acknowledge it. Sometimes in order to do that, you have to feel humanly weak and not capable. And why is that? Behind that. The emptiness that can be filled with what's true. Yeah, can any of these characteristics that are strength, can any of them be found anywhere else? Can you find them humanly? Can you buy them in a store? you find them in another person? Well, it's impossible to actually find them anywhere else. So until you get to the point where you recognize that without God, there's nothing. And God is always with us. Yeah, and only then are you receptive to it. But if you keep looking elsewhere, for strength. It's like you're blinding yourself, mesmerizing yourself away from where it is. That's why the concept of human strength is an oxymoron. There is no such thing. It's like the term human mind. There is none. No, I found that out when I was <laughs> younger because uh, I was physically strong, but I wasn't able to keep my life from falling apart. So it didn't really do anything at all. And there's uh, that quote, I can do all things through God who strengtheneth me. Through Christ, yes. Through Christ who strengtheneth me. See how many people spend a lot of time being bodybuilders and all of the strength. But in the end, how much does it protect or save you? Which leads us to number one in science and health, unless anyone would like to comment on the Bible. Okay, who would like to read number one in science and health? I'm ready. <coughs> The history of Christianity furnishes sublime proofs of the supporting influence and protecting power bestowed on man by his heavenly Father, omnipotent mind, who gives man faith and understanding whereby to defend himself, not only from temptation, but from bodily suffering. Take comments on that. Lawrence, but... Well, it's proven over and over again, isn't it? But I, what I was amazed at is look at all that God furnishes. And I mean, I years ago, I was so struck by that supporting influence because... How many times, you know, people, especially if, if you are living alone, well, who do you turn to for support? Who, who's going to tell you the right direction to take? I don't have a house or whatever, or na neighbor or whatever, whoever. 
here he's saying God is your supporting influence. Many people prove that, have proved it, are proving it, and will prove it. Protecting power, it's amazing. You don't have to be fearful of terrorist threats or anything else. And then, omnipotent mind who gives man faith. How many times I've heard people say, I don't have faith? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> you think you don't have faith? God is giving it to you, friend. And, and then understanding. How many times? I don't understand this. I don't get it. I can't, I can't figure it out. I don't understand. I don't get it. God is giving it to you. Just stop listening to the wrong voice. That's, I, have, I, I think we always have faith and understanding, but just sometimes it has been for me, you know, faith that things won't go well and <laughs> understanding that I can't do anything right. So oh, well. grateful to turn that around and have the right, <laughs> right sense of it. Most definitely. Well, no, that's a good point. I mean, we all have faith in something. Everybody has faith in something. The question is, do you have faith in something that deserves <laughs> to have faith in? Do you have faith in something that is going to let you down? can't provide for you because it's not of God. Or do you have faith in one God source of everything. Yeah, that it reminds me of the um, give me, O oh Lord, an understanding heart. Just, just burn the wrong and choose the better part. Given to you by God. <laughs> it's called wisdom. You have to ask for it. You have to be aware he's giving it to you. Should ask. Ask and you shall see, right? Yes. Seek and you shall find. And these are the things you should be seeking after and not your physical healing or your pocketbook lines or other things that are the byproducts of seeking these things. And once you get these things, the other things are added unto you, as Christ Jesus has told us. Experiences where things have worked out well and in a way that I could it'd be impossible for me to have known beforehand how it was going to do. And for me, the lesson was we'll trust a little more, have a little more faith in omnipotent good who is ever present. Let his will be done. Feeling like i got to know everything. Just turn to the one who knows it all. Yes. Any time that you have, you think things aren't going to work out right. And believe me, do I hear that a lot. Believe me, have I done it a lot. You got a negative scenario. Oh, you know, my in-laws are coming. We always fight. It's going to be terrible. Oh, that food always makes me sick. Oh, my husband annoys me when we do this. All of these things, you are having faith in evil. That's a negative scenario. You're not trusting God. Those are the little boxes that spoil the vine. You get what you expect. You do. <laughs> you do. You reap what you sow. Yeah. Hey, how about that? <laughs> 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 and here our blessed Bible tells us so. <laughs> and that's why for people not to study it, such an bad situation, we must correct. First, of course, and first and only with ourselves. And as we love it and talk about it and spread it, others will too and realize it's great value. So that's an amazing few sentences, or is it just one sentence of Mrs. Eddy? One sentence, yes. And whereby to defend yourself, not only from temptation, but from what else? 
bodily suffering. Bodily suffering. suffering. I, beautiful. <laughs> yes. Bodily suffering. I have this sunk into me slowly, and I have it circled to read. Excellent. Good. Yes. This is like this is why these one sentences are such powerhouses. Just take that one sentence. I trust all week you were working with it. You knew you were the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. One sentence like that can change your life, as does this. Powerful. And, of course, this whole lesson is on what? Temptation. 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 Animal magnetism, yes, but handling temptation. So he's giving you, you, d you can defend yourself from that and from bodily suffering. So therefore, you all, myself included, are without excuse. Right? Darn, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> How we love those excuses. <laughs> I know. Bad. No, and boys... See, that's a sure indication people are in the human mind because you will even give them this truth and they'll say, how dare you say that? Ridiculous. I heard someone this week saying that poverty is a state of mind. <laughs> and he, he's proven that it isn't because he came out of great poverty himself. He proved that poverty is a state of mind. And he was, all the people, oh, how can you say that? That's so unloving. Not unloving. It's putting a hand out to help people. So you prove, as we said, but you will reap what you sow. God never said this. God doesn't put anyone in poverty or keep anyone in poverty. You take some of these thoughts and use them and develop them, and you can rise up out of it. Many have proven that to be true, and it's only those who want to excuse themselves for the most part, who stay in it. I think it's a lot of ignorance, too, as to the, this truth. That's part of it. Well, yes, but what I'm saying, too, is even when you tell the person the truth, they don't want to hear it. Well, <laughs> and they don't want to get out of it, either. They want, they don't, and they won't. Well, you're right. I mean, there is laziness, there is willfulness that will keep someone mm -hmm. from making the truth of their own. And this isn't in any way to put anyone down, but to help and heal people. And I know for myself, because I justified all the things that were wrong with me and why I was miserable. And when you do that, you cannot rise up out of it. It's like not wanting to let go of the edge of the pool and learning how to swim. Yeah. And we're all capable because this passage just tells us so. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That many of us, most of us, some of the time, some all of the time, are afraid of change. So any change, even a change for the better, can seem somewhat frightening to a lot of people. So we have to be patient. We have to be even more loving. Our giving up the truth, and ever so patient. Thank you. Pitiful patience. <laughs> Is that what you were <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. True. And, and God gives that to us as well, patience. Lord knows it took me forever, and it's still a work in progress. Okay, let's see. How about um, who would like to read number six? You can read it. Thank you. We cannot bring out the practical proof of Christianity, which Jesus required, while error seems as potent and real to us as truth. And while we make a personal devil and an anthropomorphic God as our starting points, especially if we consider Satan 
as a being co-equal in power with deity, if not superior to him. Thank you. That's just what we were been talking about. But so don't, if you're wondering why you can't prove the science, do you believe in this other power? Now you can say that you don't, but inside you do. <laughs> you got to make sure your words are line up with your feelings. This passage starts about starting points. <clears throat> and we do approach something that needs to be resolved. But it's asking us to consider what's the starting point we're starting from. I don't know there's another passage in science and health that's helped me so many times where Ms. Ziggy says that uh, we should meet every adverse circumstance as its master. That's the whole thing, right where it belongs, as having no power of reality from the very beginning, from the starting point. And then you can work through it pretty quickly. With God's help. Anyone else? So any any time you are afraid, you make sure you ask yourself, "Am I believing in a power apart from God?" That's what animal magnetism is, and that's where the whole thing gets started. And if you are, then Line yourself back up with God. If God be for you, who can be against you? And once again, if your starting point is there is nothing but God, then it helps. Otherwise, you know, it's always the evil seems even more like it says here superior to God. Yeah, and, and how could somebody consider Satan as a being co-equal in power? How, how could that, how, how could someone do that? I think first of all, it, it, Satan is believed to be somebody or something so strongly. And, you know, the evil that we see seems so, that appears so predominant that people think, oh, there is another power. When absolutely not, there isn't. And how about if I think that my spouse is just a pain in the royal, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and there's not much that I can do about it. That giving power to a Satan, You're saying that Satan has power over your spouse that you can't do anything about. Are you believing in an evil, a false something false that you're making true? Yep. The problem is with you, not with the spouse. Yep. That's, That's right. What we learned. That's, where the <laughs> That's exactly right. Thinking. You're sowing badly. But, wasn't, know, this address, wasn't this address in the uh, Bible um, less, uh, study yesterday that the evil could not, um, Satan could not really make Jesus do anything. He was only suggesting um, all these temptations. So I guess um, we think that there is a power. We, we are taking in that belief that there is a power, but in reality is we are buying into that suggestion uh, and just have to do like Jesus said, you know, get, get thee behind me, Satan, um, of all these suggestions. Right, whether you see it in yourself or anybody else. Right. And it's easy. I mean, I understand maybe even in, as a child, or usually as a child, you'll see these terrible situations, maybe terrible situations have happened to you. So how can you say that there's no evil? I mean, honestly, it, it, it seems very real and aggressive. But you have to start somewhere, and you start as, as uh, when you think clearly about it, as Florence said, was you take the omnipotence of God as a fact, as a truth. Call it hitching your wagon to a star. 
You stayed an absolute. You might be down and you might be sick. You might have been abused. You might have been every horrible experience happening to you. Of course you would believe it to be real. It sure seems real at the time. It sure it does. And then it is easy to have negative scenarios in your mind. It happened to you before. Why wouldn't it happen to you again? Very aggressive. So, and that's why some people think, you know, that Christian science that you're crazy. These things did happen. These awful things happen, and they're probably going to happen again. And just look all around you. But, but, and it's a big but. But how do you meet it as its master? Well, you have to deal, kid, and you're all taught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knowing. Get behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. No matter how terrible it seemed at the time, it was never the truth about God's creation. It was never the truth about anyone of God's creation. That's how you meet it as its master. And that's the starting point for healing. And we can say that because, again, the Bible the Bible tells us so. We have the Genesis, the perfect creation, then we have the Adam dream. Well, all that you were experiencing was the Adam dream. It was a dream, and it wasn't the truth. And that's how you can rise, rise above the mist. The mist came over and made it seem really real. So you hitch your wagon to the star, rise up above it, and you start with the, the truth. Remember, as we've talked about, you're demesmerizing yourself with the facts and statements of truth. And you cling to them and, and get them in, imbibed in you. Let them renew your mind and get rid of all the garbage, the awful stuff that you've learned from the Adam dream. And you will find your life changing. And I know that's not easy, especially initially. That's why it takes to do it with your whole heart, mind, soul, everything in you. And if you do, God will be found of you. So, um, number eight. Florence, do you have it there? You want to read it? You wrote about it. Yes. <clears throat> Jesus uncovered and rebuked sin before he cast it out. Of a sick woman, he said that Satan had bound her, and to Peter he said, Thou art an offense unto me. He came teaching and showing men how to destroy sin, sickness, and death. He said of the fruitless tree, it is hewn down. It is believed by many that a certain magistrate who lived in the time of Jesus left this record. His rebuke is fearful. The strong language of our master confirms this description. The only civil sentence which he had for error was, Get thee behind me, Satan. Still stronger evidence that Jesus' reproof was pointed and pungent is found in his own words, showing the necessity of such forceful utterance when he cast out devils and healed the sick and sinning. The relinquishment of error deprives material sense of its false claim. Thank you very much. There you have it. Can't be nice. Why can't you be nice? Because it isn't nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> As I said, I tried being nice for many, many years. Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing. I was eaten alive day after day until I finally got tired of it. You've got to cast it out. And it, it takes strength. Strength, which, as we heard the definition of it, is given to us by God. It also requires uncovering it, rebuking it before you cast it out. And in, in Citation 12, Mrs. Eddy says, a knowledge of error and its operations must precede, precede that understanding of truth which destroys error until the entire mortal material error finally disappears and the eternal verity, man created by and of spirit is understood and recognizes the true likeness of its maker. 
got to understand. You have to have some knowledge of it. You can't keep your head buried in the sand, which I also wanted to do. Got to see how it works. Can't be stupid. That doesn't mean you read volumes and volumes of it and watch these horror movies day in and day out. <laughs> right balance. And I think what we've discussed before, when you uncover, you rebuke it like Jesus did. Because I used to, you know, something would come up that I know, and then I would own it, you know, own it, and then want to get rid of it, which is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very, very important to see the impersonal nature of it, not yours. You own it, how can you get rid of it? And and also, how can you rebuke it in others? Because you see it as them, and that's where it gets murky, and people don't want to rebuke anybody because they're going to hurt their feelings. It's not them. It's an error that's holding them in bondage. And if you really love them, you will rebuke it, in spite of their feelings. And if they're right, they'll get it, and they'll be grateful, and they'll progress. And if they're not right, well, then they'll have to figure it out some way, somehow, sometime. If they're not right, it's not your problem. <laughs> Very true. You've done, you've done what God required of you. So, And we don't seek these things out. Something just will come over you. Because you've rebuked it in your own thoughts, you've got to rebuke You can't listen to it. It's obnoxious. When I hear someone voicing error, it's very obnoxious to me. I don't see it as them, but I see it as the voice, the evil one. And I will go after it. I have to. If it was in my head, I'd be going after it. So see it that way. You'll be a lot better. And so that would make sense if you were in a camp and you were defending your camp, you wouldn't let the enemy sneak in. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. You have to shut it down to protect your... Never thought of it that way. It's very impersonal to see that it is. Right. And your consciousness is your camp. And anything that tries to sneak into your consciousness to defile what God has for you to do is the enemy. You know, week after week, we are really giving you instructions on this handling of animal magnetism, ancient, modern necromancy. It's very important because, of, as we know, this isn't, it says ancient, but it's certainly going on today. And there are those who would work deliberately through witchcraft and other things, godless ways, to try to change events in history to try to maybe manipulate your mind, your thoughts, going on. That's why you've got to be watchful and sober. So you know your thoughts are from yours and they come from God to you. No interference. And if you are watchful and sober, that you will maintain your consciousness in purity and in peace. But if you go to sleep and drift away, then... It's in, the book, it's in the book of Revelation called The Great Red Dragon that would deceive even the elect. It's up to us to see it and destroy it. Thank you. Now I want to go into this article by Keiston because it all it all follows. And the name of it is What Prospers Healing. And um, it was interesting because last week, as you, most some of you who were here last week knew we had four visitors, and then they attend a little church in New Hampshire, but one of the women said that someone from the organization came and visited them, and they were what, saying, you know, well, why isn't our church growing and what's going on here? And the people from the organization said, you need, you need better healing. That was it. And the woman telling us this, that it was so cold. I mean, what, 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 also they felt condemned. It didn't help them. Okay, so we're going to go through this. This is very, very important. And please listen. Don't drift off. 
I think I'll have Gary read it. We might stop at a few points, but giving myself a little time. Okay. What is the first one? Yeah. <clears throat> For years, and especially lately, the statement has been circulated that, quote, all we need is better healing work, end quote in order for the cause of Christian science to flourish, as it did in the early part of this century. Additionally, the sentiment is often expressed that we don't need others telling us what is wrong about our perception of Mary Baker Eddy. This view is expressed by church members, practitioners, as well as by teachers of Christian science and church officials. Do we really need to see Mary Baker Eddy in a certain way? in relation to her discovery for our cause to prosper and our healing ministry with it? Let's you and I look at what Mary Baker Eddy says about this particular point. It is what she says and what the Bible and her writings say that is important and what we need to obey and to follow. Our leader wrote to D.A. Easton, unless we have better healers, and more of this work than any other is done, our cause will not stand, and having done all, stand. Demonstration is the whole of Christian science. Nothing else proves it. Nothing else will save it and continue it with us. God has said this, and Christ Jesus has proved it. Preaching and teaching are of no use without the proof. I find that the teachers and preachers are the poorest practitioners. What does Mrs. Eddy say? On the surface, the foregoing quote would tend to corroborate the off-church statements mentioned above. But this is not representative of what Mrs. Eddy has said on this top vital topic concerning the prosperity of the cause of Christian science. How Mary Baker Eddy is perceived in relation to her discovery does affect the entire prosperity of Christian science and the success of our healing work. One must finally understand the context in which Mrs. Eddy makes such statements. She understood the crucial importance of her students seeing her properly in relation to the Bible and her discovery and how this perception affects the success of healing. To her trusted student, Judge Septimus J. Hanna, Mrs. Eddy wrote, keeping the truth of her character before the public will help the students and do more than all else for the cause. Christianity in its purity was lost by defaming and killing its defenders. Do not let this period repeat this mistake. The truth in regard to your leader heals the sick and saves the sinner. The lie has just the opposite effect. And the evil one that leads all evil in this matter knows this more clearly than do the Christian scientists in general. Divinity Course in General Coetania, page 109. On August 26, 1902, she made this timeless statement to Judge Hannah. Whoever opens most the eyes of the children of men to see aright and to understand aright that idea on earth that has best and clearest reflected by word or deed the divine principle of man and the universe will accomplish most for himself and mankind in the direction of all that is good and true. So you see, and he goes on, and we will read on, and uh, that this idea, having a right sense of Mrs. Eddy, will do a great deal in your healing work. And that is why, and she said this, which is why it's trying to be destroyed, not to appreciate who and what she is. And of course, as we've talked about, the woman in the apocalypse, the, the idea that she has this biblical prophecy is something very, very important to understand appreci and appreciate about her. And 
David Keeston call Gary again this week, right? He has four or five more books of the Smiley books, taking him to the dump. Those are the books that are explaining how she's the woman in the apocalypse, taking him to the dump. So we said, no, you're not taking to the dump. You'll send them to us. <laughs> we are going to fight this battle and hold the line and, and see Mrs. Eddy in her proper place as the revelator of this time as, and as the woman in Revelation. Who knows what good this will do for the world, for all mankind. So we will have a, a wonderful, powerful service on handling animal magnetism. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.